So I was the emergency medicine consultant on duty, leading a high-performing multidisciplinary trauma team. And the red phone had gone, and we were expecting a trauma alert in 15 minutes. It's a 25-year-old male car driver, high-speed collision, severe injuries. Systolic blood pressure, 85. Pulse, 130. The pre-hospital team have performed an RSI, bilateral thoracostomies, put a pelvic binder on, and they've given him tranexamic acid and two units of packed red cells. We're ready to receive this patient. I've activated the massive hemorrhage protocol. We've got a Belmont rapid infuser primed with blood. I've asked consultants from the specialties of general surgery, trauma and orthopedics, and radiology to be in the ED waiting for the patient's arrival. I've briefed my team, and we have a shared mental model. We're going to try and resuscitate this patient and get them through the CT scanner, find out where the non-compressible hemorrhage is, and then move to surgery or interventional radiology, who are both on standby. The patient arrives, the pre-hospital team are sweating, and there is a palpable sense of urgency, because now this patient has no recordable blood pressure. But that's fine, because my team, simultaneously, within minutes, have checked the endotracheal tube position. They've refingered the thoracostomies and confirmed that both lungs are up. The binder is in the correct position. We've given two units of pat red cells, two units of FFP, we've given some calcium, and we've also performed an e-fast ultrasound, which is unremarkable. And now I look at the invasive blood pressure, because we've got an art line in, and it's 80 systolic. And actually, I'm happy with that. We're going to use principles of permissive hypertension. I'm very fortunate that in my emergency department in Coventry, the CT scanner is in the ED, and we're going to move now to CT. I've got my blood, I've got my team, and within 11 minutes, the scan is starting, the images are coming through, and the radiologist is hot reporting for me. I look through the screen to where the patient is, having the CT scan, scan performed, and I can see the blood pressure is starting to sag again a little bit without infusion of blood products. The consultant radiologist is now finishing looking at the scan. She's going to give me a quick verbal report. And the first thing she says to me, there's no active bleeding on this scan. She didn't like what I said next. Are you sure? <laughs> She's like... <laughs> OK, there's no free fluid. There's no extravasation of contrast. Caroline, this patient is not bleeding. OK, so maybe they had some external blood loss at scene, they've got some fractures, they did have some bleeding, they haven't got active bleeding now, they've clotted it off. And maybe that's why my patient presented like that. But that doesn't fit, because now I've given six units of blood products and they're still looking bad. So now I've got consultant trauma and orthopaedic surgeon, consultant general surgeon, consultant radiologist, Oh, hi, consultant anaesthetist, lovely. And they're all looking at me, and they're asking me silently, trauma team leader, what is the plan? And at that moment, a nurse comes in and she says, blood banker on the phone, do you want the second pack of the massive hemorrhage protocol? Do I? And then I'm given a blood gas, and I look at this blood gas. 168, that's the haemoglobin. And the alarm's going off. The blood pressure is 60. And the registrar's saying, what do you want to do? What do I want to do? So I think when we see a hypotensive, blunt trauma patient, the first thing that comes into our head, as it did when we did that road to recess thing just then, the patient is bleeding. They need to go to theatre. It's our default position. And you can kind of see where we're going with that. If we think what are the reversible causes of traumatic cardiac arrest, we go hypovolemia, hypoxia, tension pneumothorax, tamponade. So that's where we've got that from. But are we honestly considering all the causes of hypertension in the primary survey? And I think maybe we should be. It's a little bit like a medical patient comes in, they're short of breath, they've got low oxygen saturations, and they've got a tachycardia. And you say, pneumonia. That's the most common cause. I'm going to treat them with antibiotics. I'm going to go and get a chest x-ray. Oh, God, the chest x-ray is normal. Actually, it could be a PE. Actually, it could be asthma. It could be cardiac ischemia. It could be anemia. 
I also think maybe we've become a bit over-reliant on our CT scanning to make the diagnosis for us. Whole body CT scanning has revolutionized the management of major trauma patients, and I don't need a randomized control trial to tell me that it saves lives. But is it making us a bit lazy? And we've talked about those patients, the code red, the code crimson, who won't make it to scan, they're too poorly. But more importantly, many of the causes of hypertension following trauma, you won't see anything abnormal on the scan. So could this patient have a traumatic brain injury? In a pre-hospital series of patients with severe head injury, one in 10 of them had hypotension and tachycardia at presentation. What was the GCS before they got intubated? And you're told the GCS was three with a systolic blood pressure of 90. Well, they should be perfusing with that. So I know before that patient goes to scan, they're probably going to have a positive CT head. But is it a bit more complicated? Is it? the patients had a hypoxic cardiac arrest from a minor head injury. I'm thinking about impact brain apnea, a concussive force to the cerebellum, where they become apneic. And if that's not treated, that will develop into a cardiac arrest. Or even more simple, someone has a minor head injury and they knock themselves out. But when they do, they fall into a position that obstructs their airway. They develop respiratory arrest, they develop cardiac arrest. The pre-hospital story for this one is that when bystanders rang for an ambulance, the patient was unconscious. And when the ambulance arrived, they were in PEA cardiac arrest. And the pre-hospital team performed bag valve mask ventilation and CPR for about two minutes, that's all, and they get a ROSC. Don't you think that's a bit easy for a traumatic cardiac arrest? So they've probably got a hypoxic arrest, and now we've got a ROSC, but they're hypertensive and they're tachycardic because they've had cardiac ischemia because they've got a secondary brain injury from that cardiac arrest. And they come into you as a trauma, and the scan at the first point that you do one is normal. Has the patient got neurogenic shock from a spinal cord injury? Does the mechanism fit that they've damaged their spine? Did they have diaphragmatic breathing? Did they have movement of all four limbs before intubation? I imagine that lots of you are thinking, you told me that the patient was hypotensive and tachycardic, and neurogenic shock is hypertension and bradycardia. But actually, one in five patients will present with a tachyarrhythmia. And there will be some patients, you're going to put through the scanner, you're going to find a vertebral body fracture, it's retropulsing into the spinal canal, and you go, there's the answer. But wouldn't it have been nice to have diagnosed that before the scan and have your inotropes, vasopressors, fluids ready to go when you've confirmed the diagnosis? In the case I described, we'd excluded two forms of chest injury. The bilateral finger thoracostomies excluded a tension, pneumothorax, and the E-fast ultrasound excluded a pericardial fluid, a tamponade. But what about if in the RTC, the heart has moved forward and the right ventricles hit the anterior chest wall in the deceleration, and they've got a cardiac contusion? Or what about if the airbag didn't deploy properly and the sternum's hit the steering wheel, and because they're young, they can decrease the diameter of their thorax by 50%, and they've squashed their heart, and they've got a cardiac contusion? And the CT scan's going to be normal. But you're emergency physicians, so you say, well, I know that if you have a normal 12-lead ECG in these patients, it will exclude a cardiac contusion, reliably. But my patient's got a blood pressure of 60 now. Do you think their 12-lead ECG is going to be normal? Or is it going to show ischemia? And so we need to do an echo on this patient to exclude cardiac contusion. And we need to look for motion wall abnormalities. I'm going to tell you a different story. This patient was trapped in the vehicle for 90 minutes, lots of intrusion into the passenger compartment, multiple limb fractures, lots of soft tissue injury. And he came to you hypotensive and tachycardic, and you gave blood, and you did a scan, and the scan was normal. Except it wasn't completely normal. He had a couple of rib fractures, fractured femur, fractured tibias, fractured humerus radius. But no active bleeding, no vascular injury, no significant torso injury.
So what's going on this one? Well, you go, OK, scan's negative. We're going to go head, no, spine, no, chest, no, normal echo. Could this patient be having an immune response to trauma? So minutes after injury, the endothelial damage and tissue damage will cause a release of pro-inflammatory mediators. And in some patients, that will be an exaggerated response. And they will come to you slightly hypotensive and tachycardic, and they will respond to blood. And if you look for subtle signs, like the spinal cord injury, they're a bit too vasodilated, they're a bit too easy to cannulate, they're a bit flushed. And these are important patients because they are some of our late trauma deaths. They die later on on intensive care from multi-organ failure. At the moment, this is a diagnosis of exclusion, but in the future, maybe, we'll be doing a blood test. Oh, they've got inflammatory mediators. Let's give them the antidote to dampen the response. What about if I tell you that this was a single vehicle RTC, and the patient just left the road and hit a tree, and they can't work out why that's happened, why, and they think, well, he's 25, he was probably texting on his mobile, to be honest. But actually, when he was, uh, got out of the car by the ambulance, he was GCS 13, he was holding his chest, cardiac injury, uh, hypotensive, tachycardic, and he comes in, and you look at the three-lead ECG, and you think, that doesn't look right, and you do a 12-lead, and he's having a STEMI, or he's having a cardiac arrhythmia. And what about if I tell you a different story, that actually this patient was driving erratically and crashed and immediately jumped out of the car and started running around the streets completely naked. And the fire service are first on the scene and they restrain this patient. He's obviously psychiatric, he's completely bonkers, he's hot and he's sweaty. And the ambulance crew get there and they sedate him and they give him some fluids because he's really hot. And he comes into you and you do a blood gas and he's really acidotic, and he's got a terrible lactate, but his scan is completely normal. There's no injuries from that crash. And this patient had excited delirium from illicit drug use before the crash. And quickly, iatrogenic causes. So if you've got a patient with mild hypovolemia and you set your peak too high, that increased intrathoracic pressure will reduce your venous return, reduce your cardiac output. So let's just check that and turn it down. And what about if the patient was stable before the RSI and immediately afterwards dropped their blood pressure, became tachycardic, and your anaesthetist at the head of the trauma bay is going, what uh, doses of drugs did you use again? But it's not that, because you've done a really thorough primary survey, and when you listen to the chest, you could hear bilateral wheeze. And when you looked on a full exposure, the patient had a rash. And they've had, which is quite rare, an anaphylaxis to rock uranium. So I just think we need to be a bit more careful about our differential diagnosis of these patients. So doing a bit more of an investigation into the pre-hospital history of the mechanism and the clinical signs, looking for those subtle clues in the primary survey, remembering that that physiological derangement may not be due to an anatomical injury and you're not going to find it on the scan. And some of you are thinking, this is not going to change my management. I'm still going to activate the massive hemorrhage protocol. And I'm still going to start giving this patient blood. And you're right. So am I. But I'm also thinking, I don't want to over-transfuse that patient to a haemoglobin of 168. And I don't want to waste precious blood products. And I don't want to lose momentum with my trauma team. Because when we got that, oh, they're not bleeding. That was a surprise, and that made us pause, and it stopped us moving on. And this patient's sick. Their systolic is 60, and what are we going to do now? And really importantly for me, as a clinician, I don't want a CT to make a diagnosis for me. I want it to confirm the diagnosis. Because the diagnosis in trauma is not always bleeding obvious. Thank you.